Exercise 3. Liberty Company reported the following January purchases and sales data for its only product. Liberty uses a perpetual inventory system. Ending inventory consists of 325 units, 171 from the January 30th purchase, 120 from the January 20th purchase, and 34 from beginning inventory. Requirement 1 asks us to determine the cost assigned to ending inventory and the cost of goods sold using the specific identification method. Now the specific identification method is fairly uncommon. The only way a company is able to use this method is if they're able to track exactly which unit the customer purchases. They must be able to trace the unit back to the specific invoice in order to determine the cost of the unit sold. This method is generally used if the inventory consists of a few relatively high cost items or items that are so unique that it's easy to go back and identify the specific cost. An auto dealership may very well be able to use the specific identification method as each car has a VIN number, the vehicle identification number, which appears on both the purchase invoice from the automaker and the customer sales invoice. So although in this case a company probably would not use specific identification for so many low cost items, let's go through and look at the process. The first thing is to determine the units and the cost of units available for sale. The units available for sale would consist of the beginning inventory, 170 units at $7 per unit, the January 20th purchases, 250 units at $6 per unit, and the January 30th purchase, 200 units at $5 per unit. In total, the company has 620 units available for sale. Each of these 620 units is in one of two places at the end of the month. The units are either sold, in which case we'll calculate cost of goods sold, or they're still in ending inventory. We're told that the ending inventory consists of 171 units from the January 30th purchase. Those units cost $5 apiece. 120 units from the purchase of January 20th at $6 per unit, and 34 units from beginning inventory where each unit costs seven dollars. We extend these amounts to calculate the value of ending inventory. 34 multiplied by 7 is 238. 120 multiplied by 6 is 720 and 171 multiplied by 5 is 855. The total cost of the 325 units in ending inventory is one thousand eight hundred thirteen dollars. So if we have 620 units available for sale at a total cost of $3,690, and of that 325 units and $1,813 are still in ending inventory, the remaining units, 620 minus 325, is 295 units, and the remaining dollars, 3,690 minus 1,813 is 1,877, is cost of goods sold and we're able to prove the accuracy of the 1,877. On January 1st, there were 170 units available, of which 34 are still in ending inventory, which means the remaining 136 units must have been sold. 136 multiplied by 7 is 952. From the January 20th purchase of 250 units, 120 units are still in ending inventory, so 130 units must have been sold. 130 multiplied by 6 is 780. And of the 200 units purchased on January 30th, 171 units are still on hand, which means 29 units have been sold. The value of ending inventory is $1,813, and the value of cost of goods sold is 1877 Total cost of goods available for sale, 3690 equals the 1813 in ending inventory, plus 1877 cost of goods sold. Requirement 2 asks us to determine the cost assigned to ending inventory and a cost of goods sold using the weighted average method. Unlike the specific identification method, where it was imperative that each item's cost is able to be traced to a specific purchase invoice, the weighted average method assumes that each unit in inventory has the same cost. This is achieved by calculating an average. We take total cost of goods available for sale and divide it by total units available for sale. And what I'm going to recommend is that you draw two T accounts, one for the dollars and one for the units. On January 1st, we have $1,190.
invested in 170 units. The cost per unit, 1,190 divided by 170, is $7 per unit. January 10th, 120 units are sold. The customer pays $15 per unit for each of the 120 units. Sales is $1,800. But now we need to calculate cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, 120 units, at the then current average of $7 per unit. Cost of goods sold is $840. Because we've sold these units, we will remove $840 from the dollar T account and 120 units from the units T account. Our subtotal $350 and 50 units. By subtracting cost of goods sold 840, ending inventory drops to $350. The remaining cost, $350, divided by the remaining units of 50, still gives us $7 per unit as an average cost. Using the weighted average method, a sale does not change the per unit average. January 20th, purchase 250 units at $6 per unit. A purchase adds both dollars and units to our T accounts. We had $1,500 and 250 units. This gives us a subtotal of $1,850 and 300 units. The cost per unit, $1,850 divided by 300 is 6.167 per unit. We now have $1,850 in inventory. January 25th, we sell 175 units, charging the customer $15 per unit. Cost of goods sold is 175 units multiplied by the most recent average, 6.167 per unit. Cost of goods sold is $1,079. We remove $1,079 and 175 units from our T accounts. This drops us to $771 in inventory remaining, invested in 125 units. We subtracted $1,079, dropping the ending inventory to $771. The remaining cost of $771 divided by the remaining units of 125 maintains an average of 6.167. January 30th, purchase 200 units at $5 per unit. A purchase adds both dollars and units to our database. We had $1,000 and 200 units. The inventory balance is now $1,771, invested in 325 units. Total cost of goods sold for the period 840 plus 1,079 is 1,919. Requirement 3 asks us to determine the cost assigned ending inventory and a cost of goods sold using FIFO. The FIFO method is one of the inventory assumptions. It is assumed that the first unit to come into the inventory database is the first unit eliminated from the database. This may or may not represent the actual flow of units. It's simply an assumption. Units are removed from the database in chronological order. The first units to come in are the first units to go out. So again, let's set up our two T accounts, one for units and one for dollars. We begin the month with 170 units at $7 per unit, a cost of 1,190. On January 10th, we sell 120 units, charging our customer $15 per unit. The cost of these units is determined using FIFO, assuming the first 120 units to come in will be the 120 units removed from the database. The first 120 units to come in are the units at $7 apiece. So of the 170 units in beginning inventory, we cross off the 170, leaving us with 50. Cost of goods sold, 120 multiplied by 7 is 840. We subtract $840, dropping us to $350. January 20th, the company purchases 250 units at $6 per unit. We add 250 units at $6 per unit to the units database and add $1,500 to our dollar database. We now have $1,850 of inventory. January 25th sold 175 units at $15 per unit. We need to eliminate 175 units and their cost from the database in chronological order. So the first 175 units that we had would be the 50 units remaining from beginning inventory. 
at which point the beginning inventory has been eliminated. And we still need to eliminate an additional 125 units. The next units would be the units at $6 per unit. 125 units at $6. So we cross out the 250, leaving us with 125. Cost of goods sold, 50 multiplied by 7 is 350, plus 125 multiplied by 6 is 750, 350 plus 750 is 1,100. Cost of goods sold for the January 25th sale is $1,100. This drops the balance in the inventory database to $750. On January 30th, 200 units are purchased at $5 per unit. We add the 200 units at $5 to the units database and add $1,000. This brings the balance in the inventory T account to 1750 Total cost of goods sold is 1940 The 120 units at $7 apiece, plus the 50 units at $7 apiece, plus the 125 units at $6 apiece. Ending inventory consists of 125 units remaining at $6 apiece, $750, plus 200 units at $5 apiece, $1,000, $750 plus $1,000, equals 1,750. And again, please make sure that you check. The total cost of goods available for sale, 3,690, must equal cost of goods sold, 1,940, plus ending inventory, 1,750. Requirement 4 asks us to go through the same process, but now assuming LIFO. The LIFO method is also an inventory assumption. It is assumed that the last item to come into the inventory database is the first item eliminated from the database. Units are removed from the database in reverse chronological order. The last units to come in are the first units to go out. Like FIFO, this may or may not represent the actual flow of units. It's simply an assumption. So we set up our units and dollars T accounts. We begin with 170 units at $7 per unit, $1,190 of inventory. On January 10th, we sell 120 units charging the customer $15 per unit. As of the date of the sale, the last units to come in are the 120 units from beginning inventory at $7 per unit. We no longer have 170 units at $7. We drop to 50 units at $7. Cost of goods sold, the credit to the inventory account, is $840, dropping the inventory balance to $350. On January 20th, purchase 250 units at $6 per unit. We add 250 units and $1,500. This brings the balance in the inventory account up to $1,850. January 25th, we sell 175 units, charging the customer $15 per unit. We need to eliminate 175 units from the database. As of the date of the sale, January 25th, the last 175 units to come into the database would be from the batch at $6 per unit. We eliminate 175 of the units at $6 per unit. So of the 250, 75 units remain. 175 multiplied by 6 is cost of goods sold of 1,050. The inventory balance drops to $800. And on January 30th, 200 units are purchased at $5 per unit. 200 multiplied by 5 is 1,000. We add $1,000 to our dollars database increasing the inventory balance to 1800 Cost of goods sold, 840 plus 1050 is 1890 And the ending inventory, 1800 represents 50 units at $7 per unit, $350, plus 75 units remaining at $6 per unit, $450, plus 200 units at $5 per unit. The total value of ending inventory is 1800